Hello again and welcome to another episode of Furry Found Footage. Today I'm going to talk to you about a very, very old film entitled The Tale of the Fox, an extremely furry entry into animated film canon and a masterpiece all its own. I'm going to talk about things like film preservation, Goethe, and medieval literature, all without once mentioning Robin Hood. Just kidding. Sounds like a blast, right? Well, strap on your male surcoat and grab your lance, because you're about to learn about the fox so important to human history that the French stopped calling foxes Goupy and started calling them Reynard. Before I begin, I'd like to mention that you can watch the entire film here, so feel free to pause and come back later if you want to watch the film first. It's the year 1149. You're in Ghent. That Ghent? Yes. And you're listening to Novartis the poet tell you the tale of Isengrimus the wolf and his age-old rival Reynardus. The fox has just convinced the wolf to go ice fishing using his tail as a lure, only for it to freeze in a lake. When Reynardus urges Isengrimus to get up, the wolf replies, You don't know what you're saying, deceiver. I have all of Scotland hanging from my buttocks. In the tales of these two budding heads, you are digesting commentary on the victories of the common man against the corrupt medieval church. There were dozens of these tales, which were folded into the later tradition of Romain de Renart in 1174, written in French rather than Latin by Pierre de Saint Cloud. It wasn't until the 1480s that William Caxton printed the History of Reynard the Fox, and Reynard is a big deal, mentioned in the Canterbury Tales and Sir Gawain in the Green Knight. Fast forward to 1794, and that's when Goethe's version, Reynike Fuchs, is written in hexameters, and this is loosely the version the film is inspired by. Wow, it took us a while to get here, huh? The Tale of the Fox, also known as its French title Le Roman de Renard, is the eighth animated feature film ever made, premiering over seven months before Disney's Snow White. What about those other films? Well, most of them are lost. We're lucky enough to have films like The New Gulliver and a loving restoration of Germany's 1926 masterpiece The Adventures of Prince Achmed, directed by a woman, by the way, Lotte Reiniger. This is the pick table. If you don't have such a thing at home, you take your best dining table, cut a hole into it, put a glass plate over it, and over the glass plate some transparent paper, and then you put some light on from underneath. And when you switch the other light in the room out, then you see with joy that your figure now is a real silhouette. Who put a couple of gay lovers in the film and fought the censors to include a gay kiss in 1926 in Germany. Honestly, I'm surprised it survived the war when the Nazis were purging queer materials. Anyway, it's basically a modern miracle that you can even watch The Tale of the Fox because its continued existence isn't making anyone any money. And that is the death knell for media in an era where we're still talking about a major studio canning films before release purely for the tax write-off. Studios and executives do not care about media, whether it's books, video games, or films. According to Martin Scorsese's Film Foundation, more than 90% of American films produced before 1929 are lost. And the Library of Congress estimates that 75% of all silent films are lost forever. The largest cause of silent film loss is intentional destruction. Intentional destruction? and all because it would cost a bit out of the bottom line to preserve these things, and there's more money in endlessly pumping out new ones of endlessly lower quality, rather than learning to repackage and teach new generations to appreciate what came before? We have lost so much of ourselves throughout history. Do we have to lose more? On that note, I'd like to take a look at the film. This film was the first animated feature from legendary stop-motion animator director Ladislav Starovich and was made in 1929 entirely by him and his daughter, Irene, seen here with these puppets I did not realize were practically life-size until this moment. Where are these things today after the film's original 1937 release? I like to think they're holding court somewhere. 
Ladislas, by the way, may have come to adore stories of Reynard after settling in France during the Russian Revolution. You heard that right. Think about the mental state of a filmmaker who fled a bloody revolution paying homage, in a way, to the country in whose breasts he found safety and fulfillment. It's pretty inspiring. These credits are a charming way to introduce us to the characters or players here. It's kind of fascinating to see an old movie like this using some of the same introductory setups as, say, old Looney Tunes. Well, that's because they get their inspiration from American vaudeville, which comes from French vaudeville, which got its inspiration from Commedia dell'arte. The way they introduce the characters by species and traits, as if they're immutably interconnected, reminds me of the Commedia's standard characters, like Sandrone, the cunning peasant, or Piero, the sad clown. I appreciate that all the animal couples are pictured together. By the way, Reynard's wife is traditionally known as Ermeline, and in some tales she remarries after one of his fake deaths and becomes the target of his revenge. Stories like this, which have their origins in medieval and even further back times, reveal that there were almost definitely 12th century peasants walking around and thinking, I am a badger, I am digging, egad. If there's one thing studying history shows you, it's that everything repeats and everything has deeper roots than you expect. I'd like to point out the fact that these stories also have humans in them, acting almost as the wrath of the gods. Consider that this film was contemporary with Beatrix Potter's stories, which also consist of a focus on bucolic values contrasted with the savage brutality of nature and its animals. Indeed, how interesting. <laughs> I wish I could meet with that fowl. <laughs> I would teach it to mind its own business. <laughs> But as to the nest, I will provide lard for the stuffy, um, lard for the omelette. Cottage core? More like cottage gore. And they didn't recoil as much from death back then. These were the 1930s, post-World War I, and it was in recent memory that industrialization had removed the need for the average family to personally slaughter everything they ate. Hence, we see imagery like a crow pecking at the wolf's lost tail, or the skeletons of devoured mother hens. <laughs> Even if this was meant for children, which it wasn't, they wouldn't have shied away from these grim images. There are nice things in this movie too, a lot of sharp, witty writing which reflects the original tales, and hey, sometimes the gags, reminiscent of Fleischer cartoons, are golden. <laughs> Who doesn't love a big, fat, happy wolf? Don't believe me that this stop-motion masterpiece shares DNA with inkblot cartoons? Check out all these starbursts when someone gets hit. Or the modern sports announcing in a medieval setting. Sir Renard, Jacques Malpertuis. Et son ennemi, Sir le Loup. In fact, there are plenty of gags we still see in modern cartoons, like the Queen Lioness shoving the cat away. Let's take a moment to appreciate the models in this film. The directors were clearly happy with them because the camera practically deep throats them half a dozen times, showing close-ups of teeth and maws fit for fur affinity. And can we talk about the queen? Rather than having to stretch the brain to apply appeal to a flat, over-designed, modern furry cartoon gal, the filmmakers flaunted the queen's legs with all the prurient alacrity of a 1930s pinup calendar. Something for the lads, huh? And the ladies, as the case may be. Apparently the castle in the siege scene is called Malapurdi, and also appears in the medieval tales. It's basically a house of tricks and traps, which... does that remind you of anything? Maybe I have a weak stomach, but the way Reynard tricks the other characters and calls humans to come and beat them is pretty hard to get behind. Apparently the wages of feeding yourself is... Death which Reynard seems quite comfortable inflicting on everyone, even despite the king's ban on meat. Except, of course, the crown may eat meat on Thursdays and Sundays. Rules for thee, but not for me, eh? Imagine you're a rabbit about to be eaten and the king decrees that no animals may eat meat. You think you're safe, right? 
You go about your little rabbit life, hanging out in the warren, digging up things, and suddenly you're brought in by the king's men to be served at the royal table. Wow, that really is what it's like to live in society these days. Also important to the film are its musical numbers, delivered in that classic warbling style of the 30s. I love the scene where the cat is serenading the queen and she's totally giving it up for him. <laughs> I also love their depiction of this kind of animal heaven with bodies reposing on clouds, floating sausages, and these terrifying cherubs. I don't care how many times they say, be not afraid, I'm gonna start screaming. Also, maybe it's just me, but these clouds really look like iced gingerbread. What do you think? And take a look at the animal fight. It's kind of amazing that these old puppets are about as good and expressive, if not more so, than the ones in Fantastic Mr. Fox. We're treated to this amazing shot of the wolf poised to kill Reynard, and he turns into death itself. I can't quite figure out what animal death is supposed to be, but he definitely looks like a predator. In the end, despite fucking over basically everybody, pissing off the king, and killing a bunch of people, Reynard becomes a beloved minister of the court, and all ends happily ever after, if your mother is not a hen. That's about all I have to say about the film, but stay tuned for a look at the Reynard tradition. Reynard's likeness shows up all over the place, and not just in Pantsless Bondage and Sherwood Forest. Renardine is a traditional Irish folk song first printed on broadsides in the late 18th century. Let's listen for a second to A.L. Lloyd's 1966 recording of Renardine. He says, if by chance you look for me, perhaps you'll not me find. But I'll be in me castle, inquire for Renardine. Day and night she followed him, his teeth so bright did shine. And he led her over the mountain, did the sly bold Renardine. This Renardine is a sly character and bold. He has teeth which shine brightly day or night. Is it a mouth of fangs, perhaps? The song keeps its mystery as he ensorcels the young lady to follow him to his castle. Malapurdi? And heaven knows what happens next. Well, actually, we might know, because scholars have discussed a connection between Renardine and the English fairy tale Mr. Fox. Having much in common with Bluebeard, Mr. Fox brings a new bride home, and she finds doors labeled, Be bold, be bold, and, but not too bold, lest your heart's blood run cold. Brave Lady Mary opens the door and finds a room full of the blood-stained bodies and bones of other beautiful young ladies, just like her. When she's able to prove it by smuggling a hacked-off hand with a diamond ring in her dress, her brothers and friends cut Mr. Fox into a thousand pieces. This story is not some forgotten minor fairy tale. It's been retold by the likes of Neil Gaiman in the poem The White Road, first appearing in 1995. Or how about the fox as both savior and saved? In The Calm in the Collar, an old Italian fairy tale, a lost prince and princess of Lombardy encounter a snow-white fox in the woods, who helps protect and feed them. When the fox is injured, they go on a journey to find him and save his life. Ah, dear brother, she continued with tears in her eyes, I can no longer live without my beloved fox. Help me, I entreat you, to find him. When the princess puts the collar on the fox, saves his life and turns him into a human, Naturally, she marries him. We, of course, have stories of clever foxes all over the world. They appear in tales among the moche of ancient Peru, not just stories, but pottery, too, Aesop's slave tales in ancient Greece, singing soprano in Janicek's The Cunning Little Vixen, or 
before as Kuzunoha, the two-faced Kitsune mother of actual person Abe no Seimei, who served the emperors of the Heian period. I've been to his shrine in Kyoto. It rules. Anyway, you might be wondering what the takeaway is from all this talk of foxes and history and folktales. Well, about that. If you remember nothing else from this video, here's what I want you to take away. Too many times I see commenters replying that, oh hey, this 70s cartoon must be the first example of a hot furry. But the reality is that appreciation for animal characters with human traits is as old as humanity itself, because there was once a time during the dawn of history when we knew we were animals and didn't have enormous social apparatuses to hide it. The Lioness Queen of this 1940s stop-motion film has as much in common with Nala as she does with the 32,000-year-old Lohenmensch figurine. When you call a character in a show or movie furry, even if you are furry yourself, you're seeing it through a lens you've adopted, through the knowledge that yes, someone who likes talking animals would like this because it's a talking animal. But that particular creation may not have been made with that in mind. Non-furries make anthropomorphic characters too. They make them ugly because people are ugly, and they make them sexy because people are sexy. It says more about humans than animals that we like when things with ears and snouts have problems like us. It helps us to not feel so alone. I'd even go so far as to say that fascination with the creatures which share our one lonely planet is intrinsic to the human experience but it's furries who want to shake you and tell you to notice that fact. We are inseparable from animals because we are an animal ourselves, a human animal made of the memories which go much further back than words, to when we slept in trees or crawled out of the ocean or when we look like this. Look it up. In that sense, animals like Reynard the Fox have always been with us and always will be. They are competitors, nuisances, inspirations, and projections of a classical set of traits, in this case cunning and cleverness, which we once ascribed to gods in earlier centuries. Gods are small now, occupying television shows, movies, and storybooks, but they're still around, and if you look to the woods, you might even see them. Thanks for sticking with me to the end. Once again, I'd love to thank my wonderful Laserdisc Patreon supporters who for $5 get to hear me say their name. So thank you, Victor the Mewtwo, Kilbaro Khan, Malcolm Thomas, JF, Delano Possum, Alex McFall, Joe the English Otter, Silly Scotty Dog, Kooky Trails, Plexo, Stubbadub, Crown, Goodall Drury, Norman Whitetail, Azalea the Witch, and Mioja.